You're probably wondering what it's like to spend a day trekking the Camino de Santiago. Well, you're in the right place. <laughs> We're going to talk about my schedule based on my trek uh, fairly recently, uh, 33 days, 880 kilometers going from the entire French way to Santiago and then adding on Finisterre, the end of the world at the end there. More or less, here was my schedule, day in and day out for those 33 days. 6.30 in the morning, oh yeah, before the sun, wake up. And you're most likely waking up in a bunk bed in an albergue. We'll get into different accommodation options towards the end of the video. But an albergue is kind of like a hostel. There may be breakfast provided where you're staying. Uh, if it is provided, then you'll have an option of toast, jam, coffee and tea, pretty basic typically. And, you know, that may or may not be offered. I usually would just skip that because, you know, I'll tell you about my go-to sort of breakfast in a moment. But what was pretty beautiful about this experience when you're waking up at 6.30, you know, sometimes I'd even wake up at 6, leave at 6.30 or pretty much be on the road for an hour and a half to two hours before the sun was even up. <laughs> and there's something about being in sometimes the woods, sometimes you feel like you're in the middle of nowhere, sometimes little villages, looking up and seeing the stars. And eventually, maybe after about 10 kilometers, anticipating maybe a 20 to 30 kilometer day, I'd stop and get something to, called a tortilla patata, which is kind of like a quiche and omelet hybrid. Uh, egg and potato and onion are the primary ingredients. And usually they'd give you a really hearty serving of pan bread. Uh, to go with that. And then I would always get a freshly squeezed orange juice, which when you want to order it there, you say Zumo di Naraha Natural. And you definitely need to say the natural part <laughs> to get it freshly squeezed if you have that preference like I do. Essentially, your day consists of walking and maybe stopping to stretch. Or if you have blisters, you're going to check on those. You're going to stop by different cafes and socialize and with other pilgrims. Pilgrims are other people that are on this trek with you. And what was so cool about that is it's an extensive journey. Some people are doing it for a weekend. That's le less typical. May many people are doing it for an entire month, for a week, for two weeks. And sometimes you lose people and then you run back into them. And it's such a cool experience to be at a rest stop and just see a bunch of people that you know and be able to take a seat. Then eventually when you're done for the day, typically, you know, I initially thought I would walk exactly 25 kilometers every day, but it doesn't really work that way, especially when you do a little bit of research on accommodations in advance. And maybe there are some that are just objectively better that you want to stay in. At the minimum, I would do about 18.9 kilometers. At the maximum, it was 32.9, but I did have some outlier days. So the outlier days were more like 15 or 16 kilometers and 47 kilometers. When that's your primary activity, you know, it's it's something that just feels less daunting than you think it would, but just be prepared for blisters. That will be another video. <laughs> anyway, back to the schedule. You may arrive at your accommodation, and I'm going to list the four types of accommodations right now that you could be arriving at. And you don't need to schedule in advance, especially if you go to a uh, public albergue, which typically they don't even accept reservations. They are typically the cheapest option with the most amount of beds. So you may be walking into a room of 50 to 100 beds <laughs> and it's a great way to meet people and be social. And it's how, you know, tried and true pilgrims do this trek. And then there are also uh, private albergues, which are a little bit more, but a little bit nicer. Maybe there are fewer people in a room. This was my um, accommodation of choice, typically a private albergue, uh, but I tried all of them that I'm going to list. And then the next is a pension. pension? Hmm? But basically it's like a hotel room, but it's not nice. Might not be that clean. <laughs> and then there is a hotel room. And I, I stayed in a place that was pretty boutique-y, that was really beautiful, actually, um, at one point with a huge bathtub, which was needed. Um, one of my things is a side note, I like to scout out a bathtub about once a week in accommodation with a bathtub. So, you know, you can always find fun, fun things to kind of keep things interesting for yourself. But anyway, you typically arrive there unless you're on one of those crazy outlier days 
anywhere in between 1 and 4 p.m., assuming that your breaks were pretty minimal. Then you check in and you can socialize or you can siesta. In Spain, things are closed from 2 to 5 p.m. It's very standard. Even sometimes when I was checking into different accommodations, maybe the host would be asleep and I would be arriving and, well, maybe a little shameless, I need to get a bed, right? So I'd knock on their door, they'd wake up from their siesta, check me in, go back to nap. It's just very standard in that culture. And while you're walking, you know, you could be in solitude by choice or just by the luck of the draw of when you decided to leave, or uh, you could be with a group, you could talk with people. It's really what you make it. And I really encourage you, if you're on this track, really tune into, do you want to be in solitude or do you want to be with people? Because sometimes people have an intention of, you know, party mode, I'm going to make so many new friends or, you know, I'm just only going to be in my own energy. But I really think a combination of the two makes the experience so much more rich. And then you're most likely going to, you know, you've snacked along the way, you're walking through towns and cities, typically uh, every three to 12 kilometers. Then you might have a pelegrin, which is Spanish for pilgrim, meal at about 7 p.m. And what a pilgrim meal is, it, it's also called menu of the day, menu del dia. It's going to consist of just a lot of food. And it could be anywhere from, I want to say, 10 to 19 euros. You'll typically have a starter, maybe a salad or soup, maybe both. And then a main dish. And you'll have dessert, you'll have bread, you'll have wine, you'll have water. So you will get nice and filled up. And maybe you'll have that dinner from seven to nine. Some people like to hang out until lights out at 10, but that was typically my cue. Okay, get in PJs. Or maybe actually, honestly, I forgot to mention the shower. <laughs> so during siesta, you're probably gonna shower first. That is going to be something that you look forward to so much in this experience because it's warm and you're dirty. You don't have a lot of clothing and you don't always get to wash them. So just being in the warm water after trekking in all the dust, maybe in mud, you know, whatever the elements are like out there. What I like to do is just put my PJs on right after my shower. And yeah, that would be my going out clothing. That would, you know, we just kind of switch things up <laughs> during this experience when you can only really have a couple outfits with you. So yeah, I wore either my nightgown and my shower sandals as my going out outfit. Or if it was cold, then I had this sort of pink two-piece number with slippers, you know, keeping it fresh. And let's say that you, you finished eating, you know, 8.30, 9. I would like to typically go to bed early, before lights out at 10, because who wants to be, you know, kind of scavenging in the dark for their things. It's best to have your bag packed and ready to go for the next day so that you're not doing too much of that. And I just would like to read before uh, just having, yeah, having that time, especially if I had a lot of socializing that day on the trail, that just got to be my time to really decompress and get ready for bed. And then 10 PM lights out and hopefully you sleep through the night. Hopefully there are not snorers. <laughs> in your room. That was one of the key reasons for me upgrading my accommodations a few times <laughs> because of maybe the night before it's not being the best sleep. Um, public albergues are not known for the best sleep of your life, but it's part of the experience. So <laughs> that in a nutshell is a day in the life on the Camino with a few extra tidbits. So I'm curious if you have already done it, how that sort of lines up with your what your experience was like, or if it's still on your radar, if you have any comments or anything that surprised you about what an average day in my Camino life was like, go ahead and comment that. And while you're here, like and subscribe. We have more videos, we being just me, <laughs> uh, more videos in the personal and professional development realms and a good amount of digital nomad and Camino stuff as well. All right, until next time.